Hey guys! I'm hoping you can hear me and that everything's good. So let me just make sure the audio is working. Welcome, welcome. And we're gonna see right now. Yeah, it's working. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Uh, you never know with live streams. You just want to be careful. I don't want to be going into 15 minutes of talking and everyone's like, we can't hear you. That would be terrible. But hi guys, how you doing? Happy Sunday if you're watching live and happy whatever day if you're watching after the fact. No matter when you're watching, I very much appreciate it. And why don't, while we wait for some people to file in, let me do my little formal intro, I suppose. So welcome everybody. Welcome fellow freaks, geeks, and nostalgic 90s nerds to my channel, Simon Slashers, where yeah, we talk about everything from Nickelodeon slime to horror movie slashers, but plenty of stuff in between, too. Like today's video, which is a book-themed video, which is basically the only videos I do, so who knows why in my intro lately I say I talk about Nickelodeon slime and horror movie slashers, because it seems like I only talk about books. But uh, I think you guys don't mind, so <laughs> whatevs. It is what it is for right now. But in April... I'm talking a lot about April lately because I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to be doing tons of nostalgic stuff, tons of stuff about TV and movies, so not just books. I'm bringing in everything nostalgic in April, so stay tuned. Hey, guys, I want to welcome you guys I see in the chat. Richard's here. Ashley's here. Halco's here. Katie's here. Cameron's here. DJ A-N-G-O-E-S-Q-U-E is here. Hello, hello. I got my fizzy water, so if you hear a fizz... <laughs> Whoa, that was loud. <laughs> it's because it's fizzy water. <laughs> Jesus, that was like a flipping bullet, it felt like. That was crazy. All right, I'm also getting text messages, so I better turn down my volume. I was just talking about what I was going to have for dinner with my boyfriend. We're going to make mini pizzas and salad, so I guess the salad makes it healthy at least. What are you guys reading? Shout it out in the comments below before we dive into our live book discussion. I just want to have some casual chit chat before we get into the discussion of House of Illusions, which is what we're gathered here today to discuss. Of course, House of Illusions is by Ruby Jean Jensen, and some people have read a lot by Ruby Jean Jensen. Some people have, you know, just read this book. If you're joining us and you're new to Ruby Jean Jensen, I have read one other book by Ruby Jean Jensen, which we'll talk about. I will do a little compare and contrast and stuff. DJ says, bought the Langoliers and the girl next door. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's um, two of the books that I'll be talking about in March. Technically, The Girl Next Door, I'm talking about that at the beginning of April. That's when the live stream is scheduled for, but I'm reading it in March, so it's my one of my March picks, technically. I'm so pumped to read it, but that sounds disturbing, so never mind. Like, I guess I'll have to phrase it differently. I'm eager to read it and see what it's all about and to compare it with Let's Go Play at the Adamses, because I know a lot of people compare it to that book. And so, is it anything like that book? I mean, obviously, it's based on the same true story as that other book, but is the tone anything like it, which I doubt it is. So we will see when I get there. Uh, I am eager to see what I think about it. And it'll be nice to have people to read it with so that I'm not scared and disturbed and sad alone. Because I, I have a feeling it will be a sad book. Um, right now, I just finished, speaking of sad books, I just literally finished last night, late last night, I finished Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Z. Bright. And that was a sad book. Also very disturbing. But yeah, it was sad in a way that it was kind of filled with melancholy. Like every flipping page, it felt like it was kind of somber, but also disturbing. I can't really describe it and why it was so sad to me, but obviously a lot of the story, if you are familiar with Poppy Z. Bright and, uh, you know, their kind of writing, a lot of the story had to do with, you know, the... the basically the HIV and AIDS crisis back when it was ramping up and everyone was kind of afraid and didn't know what to expect. And, you know, it was just a lot about that. And that was really sad because all the characters were dealing with stuff surrounding that. But of course, there were also two main characters that were killers. And it was kind of like a romance story, which is weird to say, between some killers. And that's not giving anything away. If you read the synopsis, it's right there. That's what the synopsis is. So yeah, it was a... Uh... It was hardcore. I mean, there was a lot of gore and stuff, but but also kind of like emotional and stuff too. But I enjoyed it very much. I'm gonna give it a four star rating. 
Cameron says, let's put this up here, about the Langoliers. He says, I've only watched the Langoliers miniseries and it was bonkers. Yes, it is bonkers. It really is. And he said, I'd be curious to read the novella and compare. I still need to read some Poppy Z. Bright. Yes, I mean, the, the flippin' language in the book was just beautiful. There were so many passages that I marked that I was like, oh, this is good here and this is wonderfully said here. So yeah, wonderful writer in terms of style. I really liked Poppy Z. Bright style very much. I think you'd like it too, Cameron. All right, so The Langoliers, I think you should read it, Cameron, but I know you're busy. Kat and I will be discussing The Langoliers, the book and the movie, or the made-for-TV movie, I guess you could call it, at the end of March. And I'm very excited. And also, by the way, in case you missed it, Willem Dafoe flippin' does the audiobook narration if you wanted to get it on audiobook, which I had a physical copy that you know I have, Cameron, because I bought it with you when we were hanging out. But... I ended up buying the audiobook. My library didn't have it, so I, like the only way I could find it was buying it. I'm sure it was on YouTube, but I, I try not to do that for books, you know, that are like new. I mean, Langlier's isn't new, but I just feel like it's not like an old school out of print book and out of print anything that's hard to find. So I feel like, yeah, I had to pay for it. So I paid for it and I'm really happy though because I listened to just a few sentences by Willem Dafoe and I was like, hell yeah. Eh. So yeah, Willem Dafoe. So I'm very excited about that. That's so ridiculous. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Already I could tell that I like the style of, you know, him talking and narrating the book. So I think it was a wise decision, even though I'm paying double. <laughs> I'm like, I could have just read the book, but now I'm paying for the audio. Ashley already finished it. She's in our chat right now. And she said the audio book was so good. Happy to hear that, Ashley. I am so surprised by how quickly you got through it. You really kind of plowed through the Langoliers. I'm very impressed, I gotta say. Ashley also says she's finishing up Taste Like Candy, and yes, Taste Like Candy, oh my gosh, um, I hope you are still enjoying it, Ashley, I know you were telling me on DMs that you were enjoying it, so I hope you still are. DJ also said really enjoying the troupe, thanks to me, oh, I feel great about that, thank you. Um, yeah, very excited, the troupe is another book we'll be reading in March, why am I reading so many books and having so many discussions, it's just fun, that's why. And the troop is a must read, I've heard. I have not started it yet. I am waiting to start it till closer to the end of the month, which is closer to when I'm going to have my live stream discussion, of course. So, yeah, I'm waiting, but it's hard to wait. And in fact, I always find it hard when you finish a book. Like, for instance, I just finished Exquisite Corpse, as I told you guys. What do I start next? I have, obviously, a set list of books to read. But I don't know how you guys do this. When you have a set list of books, is there a special way you pick out your next read? Let me know in the comments because I I lately have been using like a, a name picker online where you put like, you know, the ones you want to get to most, but you're still torn on which one to go to next. And then I let it pick. But even sometimes I cheat with that. Like one will come up and I'll be like, yeah, that one just won. But I don't know if I really want to read that one next. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know how you guys do it, but I need a better method because I started technically the house, uh, the last house on Needless Street which I got about a couple of sentences in, and then I got distracted with watching Rugrats in preparation for my April stuff, and I also started, like, making up prompts for my April readathon that's coming up, all about old-school nostalgic stuff, so yeah. Oh, so I didn't realize Cameron, he didn't know if he would finish House of Illusions, but he has finished it, and so now we could talk spoilers without me warning him too harshly. I was, like, gonna be very careful, but, uh, yeah, I'm so glad you finished it. Uh, perfect timing. I'm very slow, so I don't know if I would have been able to finish it like you did, but I'm glad you were able to. We have Midnight joining us. Hey, how you doing, Midnight? So glad you're here. All right, so I think we're gonna dive in, since it's been a few minutes, I think we're gonna dive into the House of Illusions discussion. All right, so I do want to show my crappy new school cover edition. I do have an old school copy, but it is rather beat up. It is not Cameron Cheney level quality. <laughs> it's just like, I'm happy to have it though, to be honest with you. But here I have the new school edition, and this is good just to have because I didn't feel scared reading it. Whereas my old school copy, I would have felt scared reading it the entire time. I would have been like, ugh, I'm, you know, breaking the, the spine even more. This one, I was just like, whatevs. I took the, the slip cover off and I was just kind of being, not rough with it. I, I don't like to be rough with any book, no matter what, but I was just not as 
you know, careful and concerned the whole time. I did mark up a few things that we will talk about and touch on. Cameron actually says his original copy of House of Illusions is beat up too. It is a rare book. I mean, most of Ruby Jean Jensen's books are rare. And let's talk about some of her other books. So shout out in the comments if any of you have read other Ruby Jean Jensen books. I know my friend Rachel, who's in my personal book club, she has read quite a few Ruby Jean Jensen books, including the one she read with me a couple of months ago, which was The Reckoning by Ruby Jean Jensen. The Reckoning, I, I did enjoy. But I feel like it was almost equal to this book, but it also had different strengths and different weaknesses. So each book, I think I'm going to wind up giving it, I think I'm winding, I think I'm giving this one a higher rating. I just can't remember my rating for The Reckoning, but I'm pretty sure it's the same technical rating, but one I rounded up and one I'm going to round down. So that is the difference. But I think they're very, very close in terms of which one I liked, you know, more than the other. I really think I did like this one a little bit more, but there were pros about The Reckoning that this one kind of, you know, didn't have those pros. It actually, you know, some of those pros from The, from the Reckoning were the weaknesses of this book, and we'll talk about that. Katie said it was her first RJJ read. It was Cameron's first RJJ read. So, yes. And also, Midnight, it was his first Ruby Jean Jensen read as well. But, Midnight says it will not be his last. That is great to hear. I'm so happy to hear that because I know some people struggled. I know specifically, Katie, since you're here, Katie said that in our Discord channel where we talk about the books during the month before the live stream discussions, guys, if you don't already um, know about my Discord, the link to that is in the description of this video right now so you can join. But in the Discord chat, Katie was saying that it, she felt like House of Illusions was ra rather slow, and she was wondering if anyone else was feeling the same way. I also felt the same way. I have no problem with character building, but I think it's because I felt like it was slow because of my other RJJ read. So reading The Reckoning, there were some parts that were kind of fast, and there were some parts that were super gory and gruesome, specifically, and this is not a spoiler because I did talk about this in my wrap-up for that month that I read The Reckoning, I said that there was freaking suits of human skin just, like, laying on a bed, like, dressed up and stuff. Yeah, a suit of human skin. I was like, whoa, damn, RJJ, damn. She went there. And so that's what I was kind of expecting when I went into House of Illusions. There was gore, do not get me wrong. However, I do think that there was less gore and less intense descriptions than in The Reckoning. So I do like The Reckoning kills better than The House of Illusion kills. What they both had in common is, and I think this is going to be typical of any RJJ read from what I have heard from other people and have read about other people, you know, after they have written a review about RJJ books, is that nobody is safe in a Ruby Jean Jensen book. I have a feeling Ruby Jean Jensen just is cool with killing off literally anybody. For instance, in The Reckoning, a dog gets killed. Um, also, you know, kids get killed. And we saw that not only in The Reckoning, I saw that, but also we saw that in, I think kids got killed in The Reckoning. Oh yeah, they did. But uh, other people got killed in The Reckoning too, not just kids. It was, it was crazy. Um, but the convoluted, there was a convoluted plot. So The Reckoning's plot was a little messy and the setting wasn't as cool at all as House of Illusions. So that was the weak points of The Reckoning that I feel like House of Illusions kind of rectified and, you know, surpassed some of the things that was lacking in flipping the other book. But when it comes to people being safe, obviously kids were killed also in House of Illusions. So yeah, Ruby Jean Jensen is cool with killing anybody, which I kind of like. And the funniest part is when you look at her picture, that's what makes it great, is, uh, is that she looks so cute. I love her. She's like a cutie, cutie, oldie. Um, I really like older people. Um, it's this thing. I always call them cutie oldies. Like, I don't want to be offensive to anyone who's older, but like, you know, people who remind me of my grandparents. So I'm, a, I'm basically indicating people of my grandparents' age. So cute little grannies and grandpas. Like, hello, you cuties. Anyway, Ruby Jean Jensen, you could be like a, you know, a third grandma for me because I think you're the cutest. Of course, she's passed on now, but like, oh, you know, in spirit, I just think she's the cutest. Anyway, but the funny thing is she's so cute, but she writes these horrific things, especially when you read The Reckoning and some of like the descriptions of the bodies and stuff. I was like, oh, there was good descriptions of bodies here. And I think 
the atmosphere was incredible. So as you guys know, a lot of you guys at least I think know, that I read this not only for our book club that we're meeting with right now, but also I read this as part of my month-long readathon that was all about carnival-themed books and circus-themed books and amusement park books. So that was the whole theme for the whole month, and a lot of you joined in, and I appreciate that so much, by the way. That really made my month even better than it would have been had I been doing that theme alone. So whenever you guys join in, it just makes it that much more better, in my opinion. But... Uh, and I read it for the readathon, and out of all the books I read, which were nine total books, all with the same theme, all about either carnivals or circuses, now I will say one book was exclusively about amusement park, and that was Fantastic Land. So not really counting that one. Every other book, which was mostly about carnivals and circuses, I feel like this one had the strongest atmosphere and the strongest uh, descriptions of sense out of all of the books I read, which is a powerful statement because like I said, I read eight other carnival themed books. Well, seven other, I'm sorry. Eight included this, including this one, but seven other carnival themed books. But this one stood out with, in, you know, with how it felt, with the descriptions that were very powerful. Like I felt like I was there at that carnival. And I did really like the main characters of Jody and Amy are two pairs of sisters. Now I know um, my friend Amber over at Secondhand Reader, she actually DNF this book and it was because she was, like, feeling sad when she was, re she was like, it's a little too sad for me right now. Like, I don't want to read it right now. So she took a break on it. She may, like, read it later. But um, I do think she's right in that there are parts that are very, very sad. Specifically, even in the beginning, we just get kind of the thoughts of the two main girls and how they're feeling left out. Like, her mother has remarried and they don't feel like there's a place for them with their mother anymore. And I guess they're right in thinking that because their mother ups and ships them off to their father, which, by the way, they've, like, literally not seen in flippin' years. So they know nothing about this father, and the father's like, la la la, like, this dude doesn't write, this dude doesn't call, and yet he's willing to take them for a whole summer. It's all very bizarre. The whole situation is very, very bizarre with the parents and the co-parenting thing going on. The mom just cool being like, yeah, we haven't talked with your dad in forever. You haven't even seen him in forever. Take a flight by yourself. Go freaking see him again by you guys' selves. You guys' selves. That's not even great language. What <laughs> Whatevs. You guys know what I'm saying. And yet, like, the mom's just cool with it. Why, mom? Why? I, I don't like that. So that was a little sad. And just the feelings of the girls, as they're described in the book, just feeling left out. And poor Amy. I mean, Amy is so like down and so not confident and i think that really comes across in the story and like kind of lends an air of melancholiness to the story itself cameron said i come from a divorced family and really related to the whole situation with the kids except i never got sent to a lot to live in a carnival yeah i mean i guess that is a pro though for the girls because like it's a new experience i just felt bad that they didn't really even know their dad and they were just sent there and when you hear about how upset amy is and jody the younger sister is the one who has to comfort amy i mean she's crying the whole flight she's crying the whole day the first day you know that she meets the dad and so i can really relate to that because there's that just like you know makes me so sad for her like no uh it would be really hard to be in a strange place katie also understands and said i grew up with divorced parents so i understand the feelings they were going through as well however i totally agree the mom sending the kids away like that was so bizarre it'd be one thing if they talked to the dad a lot but like the dad was a stranger to them and that's what was so hard not only do they have to deal with this new living situation but it was almost like they were going to live with someone they didn't even really know. That was what was weird. And uh, in regards to Ruby Jean Jensen, we've got Cool Ghoul with us in the chat. And they say, she's like a sweet grandma who will bake you cookies and then tell you the most messed up stories. Back in my day, we used to, <laughs> well, not we, but <laughs> somebody used to tear skins off of freaking people and lay them on a bed. It's <laughs> wonderful. I'm so dumb. Um, but yes, um, I just, I really like Ruby Jean Jensen's whole style, that she looks so clean cut, yet these stories are very sinister and dark. 
I think you could probably say that about many horror authors. You know, a lot of them might look kind of innocent, but then write like, you know, crazy stuff. Also, I think you could say that about some horror readers. Like, I know people in my life who are like, what is wrong with you? Who are you? Um, but I've liked horror my whole life, so I don't know why they would say, who are you? But, you know, I seem so like, ah, oh, la, 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 jolly and giddy and sweet, and yet I'm reading about the most depraved things. Cows, mother effers, cows. Uh, I read the book Cows, if you guys don't know what I'm referencing, and it was insane. People sleeping with cows. And more. <laughs> the cows, like, the sleeping with the cows wasn't that bad. <laughs> that sounds really terrible to say, but it was more of other stuff that was bad. Bathroom related things you don't want to know about, trust me. Uh, very terrible. In fact, I started to tell my friend Kat about it, and she was like, No, stop it, stop it. I was like, Okay, I won't tell you anymore. Cameron says, I liked that Amy came around to love the carnival and working with her father. It was like she found her place, but it just didn't last long. I know. Uh, you could tell that she was gaining confidence and definitely uh, becoming herself and more comfortable with herself in general, as, uh, as Cameron just said. But the thing that sucks is she's the one... First, okay, Jody finds the necklace, but she disposes of it. Of it. Amy goes and gets the necklace or talisman, whatever you want to call it, and then all the trouble ensues and continues on. And it sucks because Jody's the one who pays for it in the end. So that all very much sucks. And let's talk about the end, by the way. So guys, this is another warning, spoiler alert. We're going into big major spoilers here. So if you did not finish the book or you did not read the book at all, Please be warned now, and you might want to hop out or turn your volume down. Uh, I'll do a thumbs up when we're done with spoilers for the end, but just in case. Because I know for my Taste Like Candy stream, there were people in there who had, like Ashley, who's here right now, who had not finished it. And I feel like I was on the verge of spoiling even without warning. I mean, I warned at the very beginning, but it made me feel really bad. So I'm being extra careful today. Very careful. And we'll see uh, how that goes. All right. So the ending. I thought the ending was a little rushed. I, I really do, because we had a very uh, slow-paced story, character building, I love that, great atmosphere all throughout, some creepy stuff along the way, we had some clowns described, but I do feel like the clown descriptions got a little repetitive. I mean, how many times can you say the clowns are eyeless and stuff? Quite a lot, I guess, because it happened very much in the book where that was described at length. However, I enjoyed it, but clowns don't really freak me out, so that part wasn't like super scary to me. I will say the very first time we heard about specifically India's clown suits and the first time Jodi visits India in her trailer and then we get all of that description and how she creepily calls them her children. Now that was disturbing and off-putting and that was like, you know, very effective. However, once we hear the descriptions more than one time, it started to lose its effectiveness in my opinion only. I don't know how you guys felt about that and also about the pacing. Shout out your thoughts about all of that in the comments and I'll read them as we go on. But in terms of the end, that's the part that was rushed and everything else took its time. I wish the ending would have been a little bit more not only explained but explored. We don't really get much about the talisman or the wizard guy the warlock man, the magician, whatever you want to call him, the illusionist. He, I mean, we get who he was and that he disappeared and was like a ladies man and all this and that he kind of lived on through that talisman that had been lost but then found in the House of Mirrors. But we don't get much more. And it just kind of like, you know, the crescendo happens real quick and then it's over. It reminded me of another carnival themed story that I read, but that one was a five star read for me, even with the rushed ending. I'm referring to Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. Also a very slow paced story and it's way more about character building. Like that is the point of the story is that you get to know this family in Geek Love. And I will talk about it at length in my February wrap-up. However, I do want to tease about it now because it was freaking great. It was freaking amazing um, in terms of, like, it made me think about it for a long time afterwards. A long time afterwards. Um, very strange story. Very strange family in the story. Uh, you know, some people might have thought that it was too long. Like, my friend Kelly, she, she didn't really, like, love it, love it. 
Uh, and my friend Crystal used to love it. It used to be a favorite, but she felt differently about it when she reread it with us. But it was for a different reason. And I'll talk more about it. But, but that's another book that, like, the ending, it was, like, literally a couple of paragraphs where this big thing happened, this huge thing happened. And then it kind of moved on. And I would have liked longer with that. Same thing here with House of Illusions. I would have liked a little bit longer. However, I could forgive Geek Love for that. House of Illusions, I did kind of deduct some, you know, some star rating you know, percentage because of that, whatever you want to say. But I'm going to give you guys my rating. I want you guys to shout, shout out your ratings here in the comments as well. I am going to give it, I haven't officially rated it yet, but I have written down my rating in my agenda, which makes it official to me. So I'm going to rate it a three and a half star rating out of five, and I'm going to round it up for Goodreads. I was debating up or down, up or down, up or down all month long in February after I read this, because this was like the first book I read for February. So I was just debating the entire month. Like, I don't know whether to round it down or up. And I'm going to go with up because of the atmosphere, because of the smells and the the food. <laughs> Honestly, it made me really hungry while reading it. And I was like, this is a great description. And I thought the clowns were also very well described. It was just that it was described a little too much. Cameron has a good point here, and he could be right, because, you know, she had a churn-out novel. So Cameron says, I feel like Ruby had more planned for the ending, but Zebra was like, move it, Ruby, we need that draft. That could very well be, Cameron, that's, that's a good explanation for perhaps why it was so rushed at the end. And he also says, the ending felt so abrupt and rushed, it just ended after all this buildup. And I agree with the rep repetition, too. I got pretty tired of the same experiencing experiences happening again and again. So in The Reckoning, the other Ruby Jean Jensen book that I referred to earlier that I have already read, that was like, you know, skinning people, people's like blood, like, like skinless corpses and blood everywhere. That was awesome descriptions. But after a while, um, not only were the clowns described a lot in House of Illusions, but the only violence that really happened were people getting smashed. Like, and then the descriptions of like their body looked like they had been run over by a tractor or by a truck, whatever. Like to me, like that wasn't as creepy or scary as people being skinned. Like that is frightening. I don't want to get skinned. Now I don't want to get <laughs> run over either. <laughs> like, like, well, I prefer getting run over. No, no, no. I don't prefer either, but I'm just saying like, in terms of as a horror reader, I really think that obviously The Reckoning had the more entertaining kills. I mean, it was kind of sad and scary that, what was his name? I, I just wrote it down, too. I think it was Blaine, the boy that Jody was friends with. When Blaine was getting smashed into the flipping floor, that was terrible. That was sad. And that was a little scary. I guess just people getting slammed against floors doesn't scare me that, that much. I, I don't know. Cameron said, I'd give it two and a half stars rounded up. I like the atmosphere setting and some of the characters, but the pacing and ending were disappointing. I agree with you, Cameron, but I hope you give other Ruby Jean Jensen books a chance. And I'm going to keep reading. And I think the next time I give it a chance, I think it was The Haunting. Is that the name of the book? I have an old school copy of that one. I think that's the one that my friend Rachel read and liked. And I know a lot of people say good things about Jensen's book, at, uh, Annabelle, you know, about the doll. That one I've heard great things about. So, you know, maybe maybe that one will be better and more crazy. Because there were glimpses of the craziness and the gore and the disturbing stuff in The Reckoning. But I didn't get a lot of that here. And I so I played around with, like, I'm still even torn. Like, when Cameron's saying he's rating it at 2.5 and rounded it up, I still feel like my rating's too high. But at the same time, comparing it to The, the Reckoning... I actually gave that around the same. I think I gave it a three and a half rounded down. But I feel like House of Illusions has a better setting. I love the carnival setting. Like, if you're looking for a carnival vibe, this has this wonderful, like, vibe to it that I just really loved. Also, I'm a little biased. There were some really fun uh, wrestling. Well, there was one specific wrestling. I'm talking about professional wrestling, not, like, you know, arm wrestling or anything. But there were some wrestling... Uh, references, but also they use the word marks, which yes, is carny language or carny terminology. But the fun thing is like, okay, if you guys don't mind me going on this tangent real quick, it has to do with carnivals, but it also has to do with wrestling. So wrestling used to be a part of like carnival, uh, 
life. It used to be a part of traveling carnivals. That was like the birth of professional wrestling. It started as like a sideshow. And it, so there's all these specific uh, terms with wrestling that's associated with wrestling that's, that fans who look up stuff about wrestling know about. But all that language comes from like the carnival lifestyle, which is so fascinating to me that today carny language is used in professional wrestling. So they use the words marks. So a mark in wrestling, and also the way they used it here, is kind of, uh, you know, people who are not in the know, like basically people who are oblivious to stuff, people who the carny people or professional wrestlers can take advantage of or manipulate as they see fit. In wrestling, marks are people who are unaware that the storyline's going on, but now it's a little different than the, the infancy of wrestling. Now... People are in the know about wrestling, that it's a work. This is another term, a carny term. It's, it's called a work, which means it's a pre-planned thing. Um, a shoot means it's not pre-planned, that it's kind of happening on the fly. It's a real fight. So that's a shoot. That also comes from the carny language. So a shoot, a work, a mark, all of that is still used in wrestling. So a shoot is something that, like, you think might be real like it's they're not faking it what they're saying is true a work is something that is like fiction it, it, it's uh something that they put on to take advantage of the marks to get the marks money so it's that's kind of the very simplistic gist of what i'm trying to say but every time and, and also there's another way you could use mark like i'm marking out and i used to use this term all the time in fact i have to stop myself from using the term now because now that i talk books i know that Book people will not understand, but wrestling people do understand. Like when you say, I'm marking out, it means like I'm really excited about something. I'm freaking out. Like I'm so pumped about something. But uh, marking out now means, uh, now fans are in the know. So marking out kind of means that you're you're going with the storyline. So although you know it's false and fake, like a wrestling match, it's scripted. It's not fake because that's like an offensive word to a lot of wrestling fans and wrestlers. It's scripted and it is a wonderful choreographed dance. Even though I don't watch anymore, actually I do watch, but even though I don't really care anymore, I still respect the medium quite a bit because a lot goes into it. And it's really fascinating if you like to like research things and like find out how things work and the history of things and the history goes back to the carnival. It's cool. But anyway, so marking out kind of means like you're going along with the story and you're losing yourself in it and you can almost let yourself suspend your disbelief. So that's kind of like, I'm marking out, like I'm really excited about the story and you can buy into it as if it's real, if that makes sense. So yes, Mark has a very long history and it all goes back to the flippin' carnival. So yeah, the way they use it in House of Illusions is like, oh, don't say that in front of the Marks. The Marks are the people, the paying customers, the people that they're trying to kind of like, you know, make them spend their money. They're trying to, you know, uh, manipulate them into spending money at the carnival. So that's why they're called marks. Now, uh, I could have gone into this more in depth because I actually have a wonderful book about pro wrestling history and it discusses at length the the birth of professional wrestling. And it like literally has examples of carnival stuff that happened with like famous old school wrestlers at carnivals and like how that, you know, kind of breeded more wrestling here and there and how it expanded from there. So yeah, uh, kind of fun. Every time I saw the word Mark, I marked out. So <laughs> that was just me. Uh, I'm easily amused by things, but I was like, oh, my old knowledge is not like useless. My wrestling knowledge is helpful in this case. But yes, and this was not the only book I read in the month of February that mentioned the word Marks, which I also found very fun and I marked out about. <laughs> uh, I was really pumped just to see the word and I was like, I know the word, <laughs> whatevs. All right, Crystal's here. Hey, Crystal, how you doing? Of course, you could find her on YouTube um, at Fiber Artsy. I'll put up her little name. So, by the way, when I was referencing Geek Love earlier, Crystal was the one I was referring to who used to be a favorite of hers, but now she kind of changed her mind. She's got a really great review of it up on her channel where she kind of just freely discusses her thoughts and it's like a stream of consciousness review. I, I love that review. And I will mention it again during my February wrap up. Uh, Crystal is kind of on the same wavelength as me because I saw her Goodreads review and she also discussed how she felt about House of Illusions in the Discord. So we're kind of on the same page. I actually have a screen capture of your review, Crystal. I hope it's okay that I read it. But yes, um, Katie, I'm going to read yours too now. Katie said she feels the same way about House of Illusions as Cameron, rounded up to three stars from 2.5 because... 
she really enjoyed, uh, you know, being the uh, backside of the carnival, not just the midway and the rides. Yeah, the back, the backstage stuff from the carnival was really cool. Uh, I like how you got a glimpse into the families who traveled with the carnival, and even like the strong boys and stuff. Uh, I liked how they were saying that they were seedy characters, but that they've never caused trouble before. So like the carnival people, the people in charge of the carnival in House of Illusions knew that they had shady characters, but as long as they they didn't make trouble and they stayed in their own lane, they were cool with it. I just like kind of like how you know, they knew the kind of atmosphere and environment they had, but they were, like, a big family in a way, regardless. Midnight says, I would rate it a three and a half with a lean to a four. The end was rushed, but Jody's death shook me pretty good. Yeah, I was very sad about Jody. Like, Amy, come on! Like, why'd you have to go and, like, keep, keep this talisman, man? So, that was kind of a bummer. All right. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything. I do like this comment. Cameron says, I wanted the clowns to smash someone's head with a giant hammer, but it wasn't that kind of book. I totally agree with you. And so after reading The Reckoning by Ruby Jean Jensen, I had come to expect like a certain level of gore. And like, you know, I thought there was going to be some hardcore deaths here. Now, killing a kid is hardcore in itself. But just the way people got killed, it just didn't feel extreme to me. There is Jackson. I knew it would happen. Please, I'm sorry. I'm going to apologize. It's going to go on. Nothing I can say or do will stop it. It's people probably walking outside. Jax! Jax! Come here! Here's his feet. He's actually coming here. Oh. Okay. This is a funny comment because I was mentioning that I was talking about wrestling, not arm wrestling. Cool Ghoul said, not going to lie, I would love a horror novel themed around around arm wrestling. That would be kind of fun, actually. And people's arms break off and, like, gore gets everywhere. Uh, you know, this this guy is, like, the strongest arm wrestler ever. Uh, ever. But, you know, he frequently makes people's arms break off <laughs> in competitions. I don't know how you could, you could spin it to be a lot more entertaining. <laughs> Somebody like Cameron could write a great book <laughs> about that. Not me. But Cameron has other styles <laughs> that he writes about and other things and themes. But still, he's just a good writer and I would not be a good writer, but it could be fun. That would be a very interesting setting for a story and subject matter in general. Katie is on the same wavelength as Cameron and says, yes, I wanted the clowns to be a bit more evil and brutal. Not that they weren't creepy, but I don't know. I am with you, Katie, because as I was reading, it was like two different experiences. The first 100 pages, I was like, I'm cool with the character set up. I'm cool with the setting set up. I'm cool with the vibe. But then as it goes on, I'm like, we already heard about these clowns. We already heard this exact description. Uh, so like... That's when I started to wonder, like, is it going to get more extreme? And so I think when you feel that feeling, it kind of hinders your reading enjoyment because you're sitting there waiting for something to happen. And then when it never does or never meets your ex expectations, I should say, when it never meets those expectations, that's what kind of drags you down and hinders the experience as a whole. So th that's at least how I feel about it. So, you know... Uh, that was kind of a bummer because I just, I had come to expect something different. And my friend Kat and I, we have talked about this before. Um, expectations going into a book, that sometimes affects the whole reading experience, even if it's a great book. If you have super high expectations, it just can mess with you. Or if you have low expectations and go into a book and then, you know, you end up loving it. Sometimes you love it even more than you would have because of those low expectations, you know? And so that's why I think expectations are a tricky thing. And you've got to be careful before you go into reading something. So that's what uh, I think really affected me with this book personally. But clearly, I'm not the only one who felt the same like this way. You guys who haven't even read other Ruby Jean Jensen felt the same way. So, so it's not always only because of expectations. But I think that adds to the feeling of, you know, feeling like you're reading and the, the whole experience like the, this just kind of dragged at the end but overall you know I did like some aspects of it and that brings me to reading Crystal's review because she says it so perfectly so let me just get it up here on my slideshow all right here we go so Crystal said she's giving it a three and a half star rating and she rounded it up for four to four for Goodreads which is what I'm going to do 
Crystal says, overall, a pretty enjoyable read. Two girls are sent to live with their dad, who just happens to work at a traveling carnival. The girls quickly get wrapped up in the day-to-day -day life of the carnival as things turn sinister when the girls step into the House of Mirrors. Soon after, a carny worky, worky, a carny worker turns up dead. I enjoyed the carnival setting and the characters. I would have liked a little more information about the history of the House of Illusions and how it was connected to the present story. The ending felt a bit rushed, but was also quite a surprise. I definitely recommend checking it out, especially if you're into the carnival setting, but beware the creepy clowns. Perfectly said, Crystal, and I, I really agree with a lot of your points, especially the carnival setting. I think if you're into the setting in general and an atmosphere, the book will have you covered. But if you're into more of horrific deaths, then you might be left wanting. Crystal says, dang typos. It's okay, I know what you meant, and I have a ton of Goodreads reviews with typos. So I am sorry. I didn't mean to put up your typos. I didn't even realize there were typos. Sometimes when you read it, you can, like, correct it yourself, and so I didn't even realize. Ashley says, I loved the setting and the character development, but the story felt lacking with the horror aspect. Very much agree, Ashley. Very much agree. DJ has a good point here about books in general. It's tricky to remain impartial when a book gets great or terrible reviews. I know, that is so true, and I'm on the same page as you. And here's a great comment by Midnight. We needed more in the House of Mirrors, too. I totally agree. We, we needed much more. Uh, I did really like the character of Zulu. Zulu was a great character, as was India. Um... I wish India would have lived a little bit longer, because I thought she was a cool character. I would have liked to get more of a backstory of why she loved these clowns so much. I mean, we kind of got it, but I think that part could have been done so much better. Now let's go to some parts that I marked, if you guys don't mind. If you want to, um, if you have any quotes that you guys marked and you want to type out those quotes, if you want to talk about a specific scene that you enjoyed, please drop any of that in the comments and I'll be happy to read it. Again, keep cro uh, cropping. Why can't I talk? I'm the worst. You guys are gonna be like, she sucks at reviews and live streams. But I'd be happy to hear any of your opinions about anything. Drop them below is what I was trying to say. Cameron says Zulu was his favorite character. Mine too. I love Zulu and India too. Uh, the dad was a little, I don't know. The dad of the girls, he was okay. He was definitely super horny. Not that that makes him a bad guy, but like, you know, his girlfriend's trying to like get to know his daughters and he's like, hey, let's go bang in the forest. And she's like all pissed and that's why she ends up dying. Anyway, I felt so bad for her because uh, she was kind of upset and she really wanted to make a good impression with his daughters. So she clearly cared. But yeah, he was a little too worried about the hanky panky when he's just getting to know his daughters. Like, dude, concentrate on your family. And that's what your girlfriend's trying to do. Maybe you should take, you know, uh take a hint from what she's doing and follow her lead type of deal, but he did not. And it led to really terrible things for the girlfriend, which is sad. So uh, yeah, I liked her because she was trying to really make a good impression with the girl. So she was a decent character as well, but she didn't last long, I'll tell you that. All right. I liked this just because of the atmosphere. This is on page 10 of my hardcover copy here. So it says, Russell walked down the midway, pa passing game tents and a few sideshows, all of them closed now. There was nothing quieter or more desolate than a midway without people. A midway closed for one reason or another. The bones of the big ride stuck up into the air like so many prehistoric skeletons, empty of life, no longer blazing with light or blaring music to drown out sounds of competing rides. Like the others, he hurried away from the deserted midway as fast as he could. I like that. It's subtle. It gives a great vibe, but it also has like an air of eeriness underneath it. Like clearly Russell, and that's the dad's name that I couldn't remember. <laughs> now I remember. Russell was creeped out by being in the midway alone. So I like that description a lot. Um, again, the setting is what you should read this for. But gore fiends and, you know, horror fiends might not love it uh, to the extent that uh, people who like a good atmosphere, uh, atmospheric story would love it. I'm going to take off the dust jacket so I could easily manipulate the book. 
See, we touched on this, Crystal. She agrees with me. I said this earlier. The most unbelievable thing about the book was the mom sending the girls to live with a dude they barely know who works for a traveling carnival. Like, I know. What is wrong with her? I don't know why she'd be like, it's cool that you don't even know him. Go ahead. No wonder the girls felt so, like, kind of alone and deserted and not as important to their mom. And yet the saddest part of all is that Amy winds up back with her mom when she was like bonding with her dad at the very end of the story. That's such a bummer. Like the epilogue too kind of left me, not only did the ending and the whole crescendo in the House of Mirrors left me wanting, but the epilogue left me wanting, like not to get distracted on what I was doing, which was reading quotes, but I think this is a good sidebar. Like, you know, Russell's just driving away and it's all very sad. And then the good part was that Amy had gone home to her mother, welcomed, loved. So I guess the whole situation made the mom appreciate Amy more. But it's just kind of sad because, like, how can Amy get a, like along with the rest of her life? How can she be comfortable, you know, with what happened and make peace with it and stuff? So that's kind of sad. And she doesn't have her sister anymore. I don't know. Uh, it's supposed to be sad. I mean, most horror stories don't have a happy ending, but... Still, it's like, I still wanted more from the epilogue, like, you know, Amy's reaction after everything that happened, maybe. Like, a you know, an actual account from her thoughts. That would have been a little bit better, in my opinion. Ashley says... I love that most of the story was set and centered around the House of Mirrors. I remember going into those as a kid and I remember it feeling weird and kind of distorted reality in those. Yes, and that's what is it described in the book is that like it messes with people's heads when they go in it and see like tons of rows of mirrors. So that was another common theme and common thread of all the books I read in not every single one, but the majority of the books I read in the month of February, tons of them featured House of Mirrors, including the other book discussion that I had earlier in the week. I had a discussion about Taste Like Candy by Ivy Tholen. That had a scene in the House of Mirrors, and it was brutal. So where the kills were lacking in the Ruby Jean Jensen book, House of Mirrors, I mean, House of Illusions, it was not lacking. The kills were amazing and taste like candy. So if you guys are looking for a good slasher, Cameron, I know you like slashers and you like carnival stuff. I think you will love taste like candy. Like nobody has given it like anything like lower than a four, but I don't want to set your expectations too high. I just think it was like a decent newer slasher, which I do think is hard to do because I'm not, you know, I don't think that... I'm, I'm not completely sure it's newer YA, but literally Goodreads calls it YA, and so I didn't know a newer YA would really be as good as it was. It was good. It was really good. The epilogue was like, then all this happened next, the end. I know, right? Like, it kind of sucks. Like, that's what I wanted more. I wanted more of the experience of Amy's feelings after what happened. This is a good point here and kind of adds to the creep factor in real life. Cameron says, I also always hear that you should never have mirrors facing in your home because it can create a gateway of sorts. So a house of mirrors is probably not the safest place to be. Yeah, like, you know, a spiritual gateway. And that's what I guess, you know, magic was kind of allowed to be free and have like a way to exist in the house of mirrors in house of illusions. So I think that's kind of what maybe helped create that atmosphere, that dangerous atmosphere in the House of Mirrors, in House of Illusions. <laughs> Midnight says, yeah, it was like, poor Russell, poor Amy, see y'all later. Yeah, that's exactly what it was like. All right, so more quotes here. So this is when, is this Jody right now? Yeah, it's, it's Jody, kind of, I think it's Jody, laying in bed, trying to get to sleep one of her first nights at the carnival. She, it says, then slowly, as she stared, she began to make out a face in the dark. It seemed to have a white mouth, a blur that was ghostly and unformed, with a suggestion of a head and the body invisible, like a head suspended in the darkness at the side of the tent across the alley. Though, her, though the window was between her and whatever it was, she didn't feel safe. Quietly, she cranked it shut and drew back from it. Her body pushed against Jody. Oh, so it was Amy. This is all Amy. Even in the darkness of her bed, she felt she could still be seen. So the idea of someone watching you, I did feel like that was creepy. But again, that is described time and time again. This is only on page 20, the quote I just read, you guys. So that was effective when I first read it then. But as it goes on, 
it's too much of that. It's too much of the feeling like you're watched and not enough action, if that makes sense to you guys. All right. Just trying to find out why I marked this page. Again, more stuff about being watched. Jody removed the long necklace from around her neck and cupped the pendant in her hand. She saw the reflection of her face, distorted as Amy's had been and looking far, far away. And then suddenly another image began to move deep within the tiny angled mirrors. Something that was a mere speck in the background behind her own ugly face. She thinks her own face is ugly? That's sad. Anyway, why? A spot of color, two colors, three, red, green, purple, and then black and the white, outlined mouth of a clown as it came nearer and grew larger, like something unfolding, rising out of its cocoon. From a speck of color, it became an eighth of an inch tall, and then a quarter of an inch, and then there were two of them coming behind her. So yeah, like, that very, is very, very effective. But again, it's just that it's too much of that, and then nothing delivers. Um, and then it continues, and when she whirled, her heart stopped, her skin cold as death. I like, I did like that. And that was on page 34. And here we have a description of the children in India's trailer. This is on page 38, which I did think this was some of the best stuff in the book was when Jody first sees these hanging clown suits, which were the creepiest parts to me were these clown suits in general, more than seeing the clowns walking around before we knew that they were the same as the suits. Uh, I think just the idea that India had these, that was the creepy part to me. All right, so here we go. Let's see. I'm trying to find out where this starts. Jody looked back at the clowns. She had hardly ever been so uncomfortable. Did they have names? She couldn't bring herself to call them children. Yeah, like, who would? That is such a weird thing that, like, she's just sitting there talking to this new person who she's never met, India, that is, and she's just calling them her children. Like, I'm not crazy. These are just my kids and their suits. But uh, I can understand putting a lot of your soul into a project. Like, you know, that's how I feel about my content and stuff. But at the same time, like, this kid doesn't know anything, and so calling the suits her children, I think, is kind of something you shouldn't do right away without explaining what the hell you mean. So anyway, uh, India says, as a matter of fact, they do. I named each as I made him. The one by the door is Joey, very much like your own name, right? But I called him Joey because there are Joey clowns. Then the others are Dizzy, Sawdust, Hazy, Bozo, Rube, and Scarecrow, which I love the names, by the way. Great creative names. Jody says, they're funny names, but they... They're kind of scary looking. India rose and the sofa made its groans again, almost like sighs of relief. When she walked across the floor, the trailer shook, even more than Russell's had, though it was a lot larger than Russell's. One of her ringed hands picked up a limp arm of a clown, the one she called Joey. There was a white glove at the end of the arm, like a hand with no bones. Yes, but not really. Even grotesque clowns are funny in a way. It can be funny when a scary clown pops up from between the tents in the corner of the House of Mirrors, ready to grab you. Young people like to be scared a little, don't you? Jody twisted uncomfortably. I don't know. I guess so. Sometimes. A grotesque clown can make you feel glad to be back in the real world. India put her fingers up and touched the cruel face of the mask, the horrible sneer, the mouth that held the suggestion of needle-sharp teeth hidden there. Then she came back and sat down on the sofa, sinking into it almost to the floor. She spread her hands palm down beside her, and the jewels in her rings caught the light at the curtained window, what little there was, and made into the minuscule points of fire of green-red gold. Jody squirmed and suddenly remembered why she had come to see India. So then it goes on and on, but I, I like that, I do like that she explained it there. But just when she at first says the children, and it's like, I'd be so scared if I was Jody. I couldn't stay in the trailer. I would have to leave and be like, I have to come back later or something or make some kind of excuse. But I love that description. It's just that that description was used more than once. But uh, and I do like how she said, you know, grotesque clowns make you glad to be back in the real world. I thought that was a really great line. And that's why I marked it, because it just really stuck out to me. All right, guys, let's see what you have to say.
Yeah, Katie says the fact that she made them from her dreams as well was creepy. Also, I did like the scenes where India did feel like there was someone in her trailer and then she would find that the clown dolls had been moved. So that was super effective horror. But again, a little subtle um, and then just repeated too much. I guess I'm repeating when I'm saying that, but whatevs. It is what it is. When you're talking about a repetitive book, I guess you have to be repetitive. When I read India Says Midnight, it would have been with a crazy accent in my head. Is that weird? No, because I did kind of... Sorry, that was my old water bottle. I did kind of imagine her with kind of like an exotic accent and very um kind of flighty and unique and zany. I did kind of think of her as like a character, not just a character, but like very uh, unique character. So yeah, I, I thought that too, but I didn't read her with an accent. Like I don't read with like accents in my head. Some people can like imagine everything and it's almost like a play that they're like seeing and hearing in their head. Me, I just hear myself and I'm like, Bleh. <laughs> who wants to hear themselves? But that's what I hear. Here's another good example of the atmosphere. The air seemed layered with the smells of hot dogs and popcorn and candied apples, not mixing with the night air, but slipping in between it. And like the smells coming and going, the sounds blared and faded, drifted away one moment and stung her ears the next. I just love that. Like, this was the only book that made me want cotton candy and flipping popcorn and specifically hot dogs because there are many instances of basically Amy and Russell making hot dogs in his little food stand. So I was like, I really want hot dogs. I did not eat hot dogs in February, even though I did want them because of this book, but I should have made some after reading this book. I, I don't know why. I dropped the ball on that or I dropped the hot dog on that. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so again, more stuff about the eyes, the empty eyes of the clowns. The pointed chin, the thin slit of the mouth, the empty eyes to Joey at the end of the, the room with large white mouth curled down and again and the empty eyes. Empty eyes in all of them, yet in every one of the seven she could see them staring, staring at her. None of the faces were happy clown faces, only the oldest clown, the first, the one she had called Lazy, had a round face with round red spots on his cheeks and a red mouth that was supposed to be smiling. But even his face, cherub round, seemed ugly and evil tonight and reminded her suddenly of the happy side of the face faces of Raoul's clowns. I think that's how you say the illusionist's name. The death of India was, um, was decent, I guess. But again, it's like, I wanted more than just people getting smashed. Cameron says, this book made me want cotton candy, and I don't even like cotton candy. You don't like cotton candy? I'm surprised, Cameron. I know you're a sweets guy, just, just like I'm a sweets person. I knew that you were a sweets person, so that's surprising that you don't like cotton candy. Why don't you like it? Is it the consistency, or is it too, too sweet? Or is it that it gets your hands all, like, you know, messed up? You can't eat it easily. They, they say you can, oh, just eat it on a stick. No, bitch, it doesn't work. <laughs> Pardon my French. Oh, Pax, thank you. You're the sweetest. You're so supportive. I love you, Pax. Uh, Pax is in here just dropping by between classes to say hi. Oh, thank you. You were such a sweetheart. Isn't she the sweetest? Guys, go check out Pax's channel. Pax Panic. That's where she is. She is wonderful and just the kindest soul. And she likes the 90s, so you can't go wrong with someone who also likes the 90s. I also like the 80s as well, guys. I'm not just saying I only like the 90s. Ashley agrees with me. She really wanted a hot dog while reading this book. I, I know! That's exactly how I felt. I don't know how you guys eat hot dogs. I know this is a weird conversation, but I like to bring in food. I don't know why. I'm obsessed with food is probably the reason, but I like to bring in food into our discussions because sometimes food is thematic to the book, and since it is thematic to this book that we're talking about today, how do you eat your hot dogs? I eat mine with ketchup and mustard. Some people eat them with just ketchup. Some people eat them with just mustard, and some people eat them plain or with chili and cheese. Um, I do like a good chili dog. I used to not like chili when I was growing up, and I definitely didn't like cheese growing up. So at, growing up, I never had hot dogs with chili and cheese. Now I do, but it has to be the smallest amount of cheese because even now I like cheese, but I'm weird about it. I don't know. I'm a weirdo. That's all you guys need to know. That's the reasoning behind everything I say is I'm a weirdo. Crystal says she loves cotton candy. She can eat a whole bag of the stuff. It's my go-to carnival treat for sure. The when I want cotton candy is always at some kind of sporting event. Um, I 
obviously never really experienced that much as a kid because I never went to sporting events very much as a kid. But since dating my boyfriend, Paul, we're always going to sports events and I always, you know, they're carrying the cotton candy, cotton candy, like, um, give me the cotton candy. I would love some, but I hardly ever get it because it does mess up your hands. Even when it's in a bag, even when it's on a stick, it somehow gets on your hands and that's annoying. Crystal says they do hot dogs in NC with mustard, chili, slaw, and onions. Oh, slaw. That's unique. Onions I've heard of on hot dogs, but slaw, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Now, I know Chicago, obviously, that's a unique way to eat hot dogs. So anybody around the Chicago area eat like, you know, a Chicago style dog? Or do people, you know, anybody here, you know, prefer uh, sausages or whatever they're called? Um, You know, instead of like an actual hot dog, it's like the crap and the crappy meat. Yeah, I like the, like the crappy hot dog meat. Uh, I know that sounds weird, but I like like the cheapo hot dogs that you buy from the store. I don't know why. Katie likes her hot dogs with mustard and relish. I never have mine with relish. Carly, Carol Lee, I'm sorry, Carol Lee, I think that's how you say it. She says, love hot dogs with sauerkraut and ketchup. Wow, lots of unique ways here. This is fun. Uh, Katie likes brats or brats. <laughs> What's wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Um, I cannot speak. I cannot speak. Oh, wow. So DJ calls it candy floss there. I never, no one I know calls it candy floss. And there could be a hot dog around the corner with ketchup and mustard. Ooh. Ashley says there is a geek cookbook that has movie and show themed recipes. They need to do that for books too. And by the way, guys, I, I didn't release it this year, but I wanted to release it. So uh, I have already done this live stream back when I had a Twitch. It's not up on my YouTube, but I was going to edit it down and release it for Thanksgiving, but I just got too busy. But uh, I did a stream about the best food scenes in 90s kids movies. I don't think I did 80s ones, but I also like brought in TV. So we talked about Dexter, like and how, you know, the breakfast opening scene. We talked about Breaking Bad because they're obsessed with breakfast and Breaking Bad. Uh, I talked about, of course, Hook, where they have the imaginary feast with, you know, Robin Williams and the Lost Boys. So we talked about a lot of that. So that's not up on the YouTube channel, but I'm wanting to put that up next Thanksgiving. But yes, there are websites that you can go to because I was researching for that video. I found like how to make the the food from the Goodfellas scene where they're in prison and making like, you know, they're slicing the finest garlic and all this stuff. So yes, you can find like really cool recipes, but I'm gonna have to check out that book in, you know, specifically in particular. But yeah, they also have um, websites describing how you can make dishes from Disney's Beauty and the Beast. There's also websites describing how you can make Harry Potter themed dishes, like, you know, the feast at Hogwarts. So yes, and there's different types of feasts. Like you could do a Halloween feast. You could do a Christmas feast. By the way, speaking of that, I got to show you guys something. It's a book related and Kat gave it to me and I have not hauled it yet. So I'm going to show it to you guys. Hopefully you just didn't see my butt with the moment. I'm sorry. With these shorts are very short. And I just like got up without thinking about it. Um, this is the official Harry Potter baking book. And Kat just gave it to me as a gift. Look how cool, guys. I know a lot of you guys are Harry Potter fans, as am I. I'm a Hufflepuff. I don't know what you guys are. Drop it below if you want to, you know, share your house pride. But yeah, isn't this neat? So it's all kinds of stuff that you could make. Now, I will say, I don't think I'm going to make any you know, fancy stuff. Like, like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it look as good as some of the stuff in here. Like, I'm trying to find a good thing to show you guys. Like, yeah, I'm not going to make this freaking castle of freaking cake or whatever. There's no way I would fail. Let's see. There are some simple dishes though, like cookies, uh, Hagrid's hut rock cakes. And so it's kind of like cookies. Remember those hard cakes that Hagrid made and gave to the kids? So stuff like that. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that little extra. Hufflepuff pride forever. Katie's a Hufflepuff. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, Ravenclaw with Midnight. Ravenclaw with Crystal. Oh, we got, we got houses going on here. Groupings. Cameron's a Ravenclaw too. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, th that makes sense. Uh, also, I have been categorized as a Gryffindor before, but I knew it was wrong. 
Like, I knew I had been categorized first as a Hufflepuff. I took the quiz again, and then all of a sudden it said Gryffindor, and I was like, this ain't right. Like, I'm so technically, I do sometimes buy Gryffindor merch. However, I most associate with Hufflepuff. I don't know if that's happened to you guys with the quiz. It's happened to me. I know this is a sidebar. I'm sorry, but Harry Potter. We all can talk Harry Potter a little bit, right? Uh, at least I hope so. I hope it's okay with you guys. Ashley says she wants the baking book for the Harry Potter book. Isn't it cool? Uh, Kat's amazing. She gets me some great gifts. My friend Kat, who uh, did not read House of Illusions. That's why she's not here. But yeah, she gets me some amazing, amazing gifts. And Katie actually has her own Harry Potter cookbook as well. Uh, and she says hers is fun too. I don't know. I'm sure it's a different one than the one I have. I'm sure there's a lot, but yes. So I can't wait to release that video because I think you guys would like it. I also talk about just like, you know, here's a good example. There's a great scene in Blank Check where the kid is eating like uh, a trash can full. I don't know if it's a, it's a big tub full of ice cream. It's bigger than like a cup. It's like freaking huge. It's like this big, like a bucket of flipping ice cream and blank check. He's eating it. And he wastes it, by the way. He doesn't eat it all. I'm like, what the hell are you doing, kid? You're wasting that freaking ice cream. But yeah, there's plenty of examples of great food scenes. For instance, this is from 1989, but uh, I'm still going to mention it. Uncle Buck, those amazing big pancakes or flapjacks or whatever you want to call them that he makes for Macaulay Culkin's character and the other kids in the house. But yeah. So awesome. I wish I could make flapjacks that big, but then I'd end up wasting them. Cameron says, blank check. I had that on VHS. Yes, I love blank check. I did a whole review on blank check on my channel. Well, it was on Twitch, but I uploaded it to the channel. But yeah, I kind of broke down like some of the ridiculous parts, but I honestly love that movie and I quote it all the time. Uh, I don't know why I still quote it, but there's this great part where one of the bad guys is like, hey, ho, when he's supposed to be like avoiding baseballs and yet he's just dancing. Of course, that's, and I never know how to say his name, T-O-N-E-L-O-C, that rapper and actor who did a lot of awesome things back in the day, especially growing up when I was a kid. I never know how to pronounce it and I always pronounce it wrong, so I'm not even going to try so that nobody can say it's wrong. Uh, but yes, he uh, is the bad guy I'm referring to who goes, hey, Oh, and it's so dumb. Oh my God. It's amazing. I love that movie. There's a lot of great 90s uh, food scenes from other awesome nostalgic. I mean, heavyweights. Heavyweights. <laughs> you could literally like dream about any of the food in that food fight, even though the food fight comes off as really gross, in my opinion. Uh, so I wouldn't really want to eat the food at the food fight, but I would want to buy the same food and eat it like without having watched that scene. But yes, great food at that heavyweights food fight scene which is another wonderful old school 90s movie. Don't get me started. Old school April has not started already. And I'm already obsessed with it. Like I've been like just planning content and we're like over a month away from, not over a month, we're over a month away from when I would be even starting like the stuff, but no, we're not. We're under a month away, but it's, it's barely a month long away because it's only March 6th. You guys know what I'm saying. I'm ridiculous. All right. Here is what you guys were talking about, about the mirror kind of being disoriented, uh, disorienting, and all of that. So it says here, the mirrors were in there, facing one another, in all angles and degrees, some of them distorting in shape, making a figure look fat and short or tall and stringy thin. And it was in there, among those mirrors, that the beginning was, India had told him. So of course, this is India telling Zulu about the whole magician thing and you know, the creepy house of mirrors and how her father disappeared after fighting with the bird-like magician dude. Was he a demon? What do you guys think he was? The magician. Um, Because India believed that he was not human. Do you guys believe that? <laughs> DJ says, I live near Harry Potter world and fed up with getting stuck behind the bus. Oh my god, I'd have so many butterbeers. By the way, speaking of more Harry Potter food, I'm sorry to keep going on these tangents, but I think you guys like it too. Um, so speaking of butterbeer and food in general, I, I made butterbeer at home. It was so awesome. So you basically, uh, it's pretty easy. You get like butterscotch, um, syrup like you know how they have chocolate syrup for sundays they have butterscotch syrup for sundays so you get that you get lots of ice and i think you get diet cream soda so diet well, you could do regular cream soda if you don't want to do diet but um anyway you blend 
the cream soda, the ice, and you put in the butterscotch, and I think that's all of it. And then you could freeze it, and it makes, like, a, a butter beer. It tastes like a butter beer. And yeah, it did taste accurate. And it was awesome. And now I want to make it again. Why am I dancing with food? What is with me? I'm ridiculous. And Ashley agrees with me about the waste. Uh, Preston is the main kid's name from Blank Check. Yes, she's like Preston from Blank Check Wasted. He should have invited his friends to eat it with him. He only had a, a flippin' limo driver as a friend at that point. <laughs> Which is very sad. Everyone was very mean to Preston. And he's got the worst parents ever. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on Blank Check, I do have that review I referenced. It's like an hour long, but yeah. Preston has the worst parents of all time. They're so mean to him, and his brothers are assholes. Anyway, don't get me started on Blank Check. Uh, or Free Willy. Free Willy I could talk about way longer than Blank Check. Um, I have a two-hour conversation up. It's one of the most, like, things, one of my streams that I'm most proud of in the entire world is my Free Willy stream, because I talk about the, the actual Orca who played Willy, who was actually released out into the wild, and there's a documentary surrounding that, so I talked about that. Yeah, Free Willy also has um, some cool stuff in it. Uh, I don't know about regards to food. Oh, yes, in regards to food. I do mention that in my food stream that I'm going to eventually upload the cake. These uh, homeless kids are all hanging out, and they're eating this awesome cake that they steal, and it looks so good, but then they uh, step on it and ruin the cake. And one kid, I think, is putting, like, hot sauce on the cake, which is disgusting. But anyway, but the cake looked amazing. And every time I watch Free Willy, I want freaking birthday cake. So anyway, I talk about the cake in the Free Willy stream. And uh, I talk about a lot of other things. And orcas in general and, like, the histories. Please, guys, if you love my content and you like Free Willy, please go check that video out. It's, like, one of the videos I prepped the most for. And it's, like, I know it's old. But uh, it's really well produced, in my opinion. Like, it's one of the things I'm most proud about ever. I don't know why. I just, I love that stream. So if you guys are interested in the Free Willy thing, please go look it up. If you don't want, or go watch it if you'd like. Only if you're interested, though. What? Oh my god, I didn't know this. Cameron says, you can order butterbeer frappes from Starbucks. Sometimes I have to give them the recipe, but most of them seem to know how to make it. I didn't know you could just do that. Oh my god, that's incredible. That is so cool. I'm gonna have to go and see if, like, the one around here could do that. Oh my god. Crystal says she's still confused about what the talisman was. A link to the illusionist? Was it something magical he created? So maybe he wasn't human? I'm guessing it's... You're right. I'm very confused, too. Like, was it where his soul lived or where his power lived. And I forgot, of course, I read the book, but I forgot how they explained why he was trapped in the talisman in the first place. Like, why he disappeared when he was fighting with India's dad. I forgot what happened that made him get stuck in there in the first place. So you're right, what the hell does the talisman do? And why was it so easily lost for so many years? And then randomly found? And anyway, I, I do think it he was probably a demon, um, I guess, t taking human form. That's the only way I could explain it. Midnight says, an evil demon from the mirror dimension. I like that explanation. Here's a good explanation here. Katie says, I assumed the magician put on the talisman to take human form, but I was a little confused about that too. I felt it was a big part of what was going on, but not elaborated enough in its origin. I know, it was not elaborated on enough at all, and it was very frustrating because um, that's what I would have I liked to know more about. You know, haunted and hidden objects are kind of fun in books and movies and shows. And in fact, I know I... I posted about this on Instagram, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but there's a great episode of my favorite podcast called the Big Orange Couch Podcast. You could just find it by searching Big Orange Couch. Their recent episode was looking at, are you afraid of the dark objects? So like magical objects used in Are You For The Dark episodes. And so they each pick out, it's the two main hosts and their friend. They always have like a different guest almost every episode. Most of the time, it's three people, like the two hosts and then somebody else, but sometimes it's just the two hosts. Anyway, it is the greatest podcast ever if you love Nickelodeon, 90s Nickelodeon specifically. But yeah, they they give their top five lists about Are You For The Dark haunted objects. So the talisman could be a great haunted object from House of Illusions if it was elaborated on more and if it was kind of fleshed out a little more. However, 
it was not. So alas, it cannot be a badass haunted object from a book that I've read because it just did not deliver in that it wasn't like, it wasn't discussed at length really. So, so definitely. Katie says, I didn't realize that the magician was stuck in the talisman. I thought he was living in the dark corners of the mirror maze. Yeah, I, w I, I don't even know, remember how he got stuck now. I don't, I mean, because I read this at the beginning of February and I should have taken notes. I mean, I did take like flipping barely any notes. Um, I did mark passages as I told you guys, but it wasn't anything explaining how he got stuck in the first place or how people thought he got stuck. Um, do I even have anything about that? No. Not at all. No help, notes. No help. All right. Definitely underexplained. Crystal agrees. Yes. And again, here we have another passage on page 187 of the hardcover. Their curved, clawed-like white gloves, so deceptive, seemed the most frightening of all to Jody, for it was the gloves that picked Blaine up again and again and threw him to the floor until his body looked in its non-resistance as if it were made of rubber. So yeah, that's kind of creepy, I guess. Someone was sobbing hysterically. Jody felt the tears on her cheeks, but only in a half-aware part of her mind. She was no longer able to try to protect herself. She had only one need, to get Blaine and get him away from the clowns. And then it goes on to say, Blaine was on the floor, twisted, his arms and legs askew, his eyes bulging from their sockets and oozing blood. His hair was smeared with blood and the blood ran out of his nose and mouth, his face smashed and red and raw, as if the skin had been ripped from his body. Now there's a little touch of gore and horror. It was okay. But after just reading a freaking Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Zoo Bright, Crystal, I know you agree. Crystal also just finished exquisite corpse this is nothing this is like playground fodder compared to exquisite corpse not only was there a lot of gore there was a freaking lot of sex it was pretty hard freaking core uh i mean jesus it, uh, not to say jesus sorry but that's something my mom says all the time so i say it sometimes without meaning to it's a trait I, I get from her but yeah uh i was like whoa this is hardcore in many ways also, something with a gator, and I think you guys should check out Exquisite Corpse, because that was really fascinating. By the way, Crystal and I both read Exquisite Corpse for our friend Kelly's book club, and I'd like to encourage you guys to check out her book club. If you're interested in reading the book for this month anyway, uh, you could go and join her Discord. Again, just look her up on Instagram, Kelly Hooked on Books, and you could find the link to her Discord through her Instagram. She also has a YouTube channel. And yeah, uh, if you're interested in reading it, it is crazy. It is hardcore. Uh, there's lots of New Orleans references, not to go back to food again, but beignets. Beignets. <laughs> well, there's something seriously wrong with me. Also, jambalaya they talk about, which I love jambalaya. They also talk about Cajuns, and I'm Cajun. I'm not Australian. <laughs> I am Cajun. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, Katie says, I need to read Exquisite Corpse. It's on her TBR, I feel like I need to check it out soon. Yeah, I would love to know what you think about it. I know you like brutal stuff. You're in the same wavelength as me. Now, I will say, Crystal gave it a five-star rating. I already looked at her. I scoped out her Goodreads rating. I'm going to give it, like, a four because of one thing I wish would have been a little different and because also it was hard to, like, empathize with parts of, like, the main characters, but you're not supposed to. But you do empathize with the larger thing that's going on, you know, the the terrible stuff around HIV and AIDS and all, you know, the terrible things that the gay population had to deal with back then when it was just, you know, being discovered that that was happening. So, so yeah, I mean, that part was sad and I totally empathized with, but the killers themselves, it was like, man, these guys are crazy. But the horror was wonderful for, for sure. <laughs> Katie says, there's not something seriously wrong with me. There's something seriously right with me. I'm so glad you think so, Katie. Thank you. Yes, horror friends for life. <laughs> I love that. Uh, you guys know what we mean, but I did laugh. Uh, Crystal was describing Taste Like Candy on one of her YouTube videos and said, the violence was really well done. And then she said, I feel weird saying that. And I, I got what she meant because the wrong people listening might take that the wrong way. <laughs> so you always kind of wonder when people who are non-horror fans tune in every now and then type of thing. 
uh, what they're gonna think and all that. But I like how this stream we brought in regular 90s stuff too, because that always brings me a lot of joy. Even though it's not scary stuff, it's it's still like the stuff that I love. So thanks guys for letting me have those sidebars too. Ashley says, I've been making her want some king cake. Yes, they did not mention, I don't think they mentioned king cake in Exquisite Corpse, but Poppy Z. Bright knows New Orleans. If you do end up reading Exquisite Corpse, guys, everything you read about New Orleans is really accurate in terms of the places. Like, everything that they write about is pretty damn accurate, and it was really impressive to me. I was telling people in the Discord, on Kelly's Discord, that my favorite part, it's not my favorite part, but my favorite reference of New Orleans in Exquisite Corpse was they referenced this old convenience store called K&B. Uh, it's got a longer name. It's very hard to pronounce. It's like Cats and Beth Stoff. I, I can't even freaking pronounce it, but it's a legendary New Orleans like place that used to exist. And there's this whole line of stuff that people like to reminisce about. And uh, there's all these things that uh, say, ain't dare no more. So there's like, you could find coasters and it says, ain't there no more. And then the logo of Canby will be there. And also another thing mentioned in Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Z. Bright is uh, they mention Schwegmans, which is also not around anymore. So you get a lot of New Orleans people who are very nostalgic for KB, for Schwegmans, for a lot of, uh, they also mentioned DH Holmes, which is another thing that doesn't exist anymore or uh, Maison Blanche. So anyway, yes, all of these references in freaking Exquisite Corpse were like blowing my mind. I was like, oh, old school New Orleans. So it's not even just New Orleans references, it's old school New Orleans references, which I know about because my job, we used to make documentaries about old school New Orleans. So all of that is very familiar to me and it kind of makes me get excited or mark out to connect it back to carnival language. And speaking of carnival language, not to always go off like tangents uh, and everything, but uh, back to another quote from the book, back on script for a second um, until our next sidebar. So it says here, so this is a reference to wrestling specifically. It says the men with Zulu he noticed for the first time were big enough and strong enough to commit the kind of atrocious murders that had taken place in the past three days and nights. But they were men he had known for several years. Why was he suspecting a man who just the other night he had trusted to escort Amy to the trailer? And the other two, one of whom was called Shorty, Lord only knew why, since he was six feet six, and the other known as Utah, who also had been a wrestler back when wrestling had been an act with the carnival, were both good old Joes he had drunk beer with in beer joints all over the country, and now he was suspecting them? So I just love how they said, uh, that cemented what I was saying about wrestling used to be a part of the carnival. And so I think that's so cool that there it is, my proof right there. So I had to mark that passage, of course. But yeah, cool stuff. I don't know why the connections amuse me so much. And I'm like, eh, I know, I know about it. All right. So Cameron said, because I did get Cameron a king cake when I went up to visit him, which was like the greatest day ever, by the way, Cameron. Oh, I miss you. I wish you lived closer. It'd be so much fun to like bookshop and talk movies and books and stuff. But Cameron said he ate his entire king cake in like five days. Good. Uh, because I was already worried about the freshness of it. There was only so fast I could get it to you from New Orleans. Um, but yes, a good fresh king cake from an actual bakery, there's nothing better. You got to be careful because grocery store bakeries, sometimes if you just go to a cheap grocery store, they're not going to give you a good quality king cake. So guys, anyone visiting New Orleans in the future, be aware of that. Be picky of where you get your king cakes. There are a lot of options and a lot of places where you are pretty safe and you mostly can't go wrong. However, my boyfriend Paul... Not to say he sucked at buying a king cake, but he ain't from here, so he doesn't really know what to do. Uh, he does. He's lived here for a long time. Uh, he was telling me the other day, aren't I like a New Orleanian because I've been here like 13 years? I'm like, no, bitch, you ain't from here. Anyway, <laughs> it's not been long enough. Uh, I was like, you can't say you're from here one second and then complain about all these other New Orleans things in another second. But he bought a Winn-Dixie, which is a local chain of grocery stores, which I'm sure they're all over the place. But... He bought a Winn-Dixie king cake and it was bad. It was so bad. I told him this tastes like wheat bread. I was like, this is like terrible. And so that's what he got before freaking Mardi Gras. Like, so we had three or four king cakes the whole season because Mardi Gras is not just a day. It's a season. Not to go on these sidebars, but in case you guys are wondering, and it does have to do with books since the book I just read referenced New Orleans. So it's still kind of bookish. But yeah, um, it's a whole season long. And so you can have cake the whole time and it's awesome so you could find king cakes everywhere and the closer it gets to mardi gras the more like where you go they'll have more cakes and 
more people want them the closer it gets, basically. But yeah, mostly you can't go wrong, but there are a few places you don't want to get them from. When dixie being one of them, that was the worst. And I couldn't believe that was the king cake we had at our house for Mardi Gras week. However, he ate it. I was like, you eat the rest, whatevs. I actually had a king, uh, not a king cake, a cookie cake that uh, he had bought for some other reason. We were going to give it to somebody, but it would have been too expensive to mail. So we ended up keeping it and eating it for ourselves. And I ate most of it. In fact, that was my breakfast today was cookie cake. Cameron said, best day ever. No, it was totally the best day ever for me. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, I still think so fondly of that day. And it was not that long ago. But it feels like it was a year ago now for some reason. Uh, I, I wish it could happen again very soon. But who knows when. But you're so much fun. Thank you so much again. Ashley says, bakeries are the best to get them from, but sometimes I've got to get them from the store. It's not bad. Not all stores, like Rouse's, which is another grocery store chain, their bakery is actually pretty darn good. Also, there's this other uh, baker, like grocery store with a good bakery called Dornax. Now, that's a good place, too. I was also laughing about neighborhoods and streets in Exquisite Corpse and wondering how, like, people like Crystal, although she's visited New Orleans, but I was wondering how certain people were reading the names, because, like, when I don't know how to pronounce something, I don't know how you guys read it, but I'll read over it and be like, blah, 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 <laughs> and, like, I just, like, don't even pronounce it in my head even. I just kind of, like, glance over the word I can't say or the place I can't say. But um, in terms of the New Orleans places, like, there was stuff like the, the Marini, which is spelled weird. There was all kinds of things. I wish I had it in front of me to tell you guys the things I was like, oh, how did they read that in their head? Like, did they read it the right way? Like, I even said Schwegmans. Like, would they know how to say Schwegmans? <laughs> uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Then they were talking about Dixie Beer, which is like a beer brand. It is actually still around today. It had gone away and come back, and now it's been renamed to Faubourg um after like a neighborhood so that's also a neighborhood name is Foberg and um yeah there's lots of stuff like that in Exquisite Corpse so if you guys are interested more in New Orleans culture and you want to like uh read more about places and stuff I would check it out and also if you love gore because it had tons of gore but beware there's like tons of triggers and lots of sex too so it's very graphic but I did enjoy it very much and again a four star rating for me I'm giving you guys the sneak preview because I'm not going to talk about it for another month for my wrap-up uh, will be in April, so it'll be a while. All right, guys, we're winding down. I want to hear any last minute thoughts that you guys have for House of Illusions, which we are wrapping up the discussion of right now. So I'm going to read another quote from page 240 as you guys type up whatever else you want to say, and then we'll wrap it up. I feel bad. I know it's been long. I appreciate you guys hanging. So it says, she became confused. Everywhere she looked, the light of the ceiling was reflected, and the little girl in the pajamas with the blonde hair loose on her shoulders like Alice in Wonderland, only this wasn't Wonderland. This was a netherworld where gods like Hades ruled, a world of crazy mirrors where children were lost and never found, a dark world of swirling waters and black tree trunks and clowns with terrible faces. It wanted Amy, this world, Amy and the necklace. It was the necklace that had caused it all, and Jody had found the necklace and it was because of her that this world wanted her sister because she had the bad necklace. I liked that that little passage. I thought that was very well written. Again, this isn't a poorly written book. I know some people, I know like, for instance, Will Erickson, check out his wonderful blog, Too Much Horror Fiction. He'll sometimes say like, you know, uh, he'll describe people back in the day wanting to read Ruby Jean Jensen and being like, that was like, you know, kind of like mainstream, not trash, but you know, just like really popular uh, generic mainstream stuff to where some people might have thought of it as like kind of trash. But I think it's actually very entertaining. I like the way she writes. Um, it's just that this one didn't have enough horror. That's the only reason it wasn't a better read for me, just because it kind of dragged and made it, you know, go slower. So the death of Jody is also pretty pretty quick. The clowns moved suddenly, unexpectedly, and the small body of Jody was slammed to the floor. More slamming. Whatevs. It, this is all that's happening in this book, is the, the slamming. Um, several other men had entered the central room, and they stood as, as if turned to the glass themselves, staring, and the silence was an endless... I cannot read. Was as endless as the walls, except for the one series of sounds. 
Her bones broke. Her head against the floor split open. Her skin was split from her body. Her blood squirted and ran, small rivers carrying the last of her heartbeats. Zulu heard these sounds, as if they were magnified in the horror of the distorted world. He even heard the bursting of her heart. So that's like the moments of like, of really impressive parts that I liked. Like that little glimmer, I liked it. So when you read it, little parts like that, you know, here and there, it's impressive. But when, as a whole, you're like slogging on, that's when it was just kind of like dragging a little bit. Oh yeah, so one last, uh, again, about the qu clowns on page 134. These were not faces of clowns she had seen, clowns she had loved and laughed at. These were the faces of terrible things, of empty eyes, again, and cruel mouths, of witches and warlocks, of ghouls that rise from the graves of hell. But I did like the last part of the sentence with the witches, warlocks, and the ghouls. That was really well done at the end there. We already heard about the empty eyes and the mouths, but the other part's great. Without breathing, she watched them go by. They went to open the door of India's trailer and climb the steps. The door remained open. Amy waited, but they didn't return. So that's the last quote I have. That's it. Yes. Now I can take all my tabs out. So I just wanted to get through that. All right, guys. Crystal says, it was my first Ruby Jean Jensen book, and it was a fun read, and I'm looking forward to reading more from her. Good, I'm glad you're not giving up on her. I know you gave it a decent rating. I hope other people who gave it a more low rating still will give Ruby Jean Jensen another chance. Again, my friend Rachel, I think she read The Haunting and liked that one a lot. I have to ask her. I'll DM I'll DM her after and, uh, and ask her. And I know she read House of Illusions because I saw her rating on Goodreads. It was a three star. So she obviously didn't like House of Illusions as much as whatever one she told me about before. So I'll have to ask her. And maybe we'll do a future group read of that. By the way, guys, start brainstorming any books you'd like to nominate for my group read for, I know this is far away, but for April. Our March picks are already, you know, picked out. But April, I want to be prepared because I want to release the TBR video way sooner than I did for my March TBR. I, I had to release that, like, a few days ago. So I want to release the April one in March instead of in April. So guys, be brainstorming some suggestions. I have uh, Book of the Damned by D.A. Fowler. I've been really wanting to get to that. I know my friend Alex the Bookubus wants to read that. Um, I want to read The Cartoonist, which is available. It's an older book, but it's available in like a digital format as well, like a Kindle edition. So you can get like a new copy if you want. Now, the cover's not great for the new cover. Of course, it's terrible. But at least, you know, it's available for people to read if anyone's interested. So The Cartoonist I'm thinking of, uh, like I said... The uh, the Book of the Damned. I know I have more. I kind of want to pull up uh, something I've been working on. I'm not going to show you guys, but I need to see it. Let me just look over here real quick. So that you guys cannot see. Actually, it's, on, it's online. Hold on. Oh, my Canva. So I've been working on the readathon. So guys, if you didn't know what I'm referring to, uh, not only our group read in April, but I'll be hosting another readathon, just like we did this readathon for February with the carnival reads and all that. I'm going to be doing another readathon in April, but it's all centered around old school stuff. There's going to be a lot of Are You For The Dark thematic stuff, but also goosebumps and also other things. And I made a list of very loose prompts that could be interpreted a number of ways. So I think it's going to be loose enough to where people can do the prompts, but they're optional. So people could just literally read paperbacks from hell and that's it like if they don't want to do goosebumps if they don't want to do are you for the dark stuff they could literally just read flipping paperbacks from hell and watch 80s horror movies or 70s movies or whatever literally it could be interpreted any way the only criteria to really be able to participate in the readathon is that you read stuff that is old school hence the name old school april that's the whole theme but basically just read and and or watch anything that was released in 2002 or earlier so that is the criteria but Another one I'm thinking about, where are you? Come on, load, bitch. Uh, another thing I'm thinking about, oh yes, oh yes. Um, Feast, also known as Ritual by Graham Masterton. Also another extreme book. Tons of triggers contained in that one, so be warned. But yeah, I'm thinking about that one as well. Uh, so if any of those appeal to you guys, make sure you let me know. I'm going to put out a post. I, I think it's going to be in a few days. Where's my agenda? In a few days, I'm putting out a post asking for nominations and suggestions. I'll probably name the books I just told you guys, and you guys can second them. Or if you have other ideas, again, the only criteria for 
April will be, I don't want any new books, so I would prefer all the books nominated be from the 90s, 80s, or earlier. So please keep that in mind, guys. Cameron says DA follower... D.A. Fowler is great. I know, I mean, I kind of know. I read half of her book on audio. Um, you know, what's wrong with Valerie? I have to finish it, but I'm loving it so far. Cameron says, I still want to read everything RJJ has written, despite giving House of Illusions a 2.5. He still wants to read more, and I'm so happy to hear that, Cameron. That's great news. Great, great news. And Cameron says, I'd love to read Feast. Yes! Even if it doesn't win, Cameron, if you want, we could buddy read it. It's up to you, though. I know you are already reading a ton, so uh, up to you. But uh, I'm going to think I'm going to read it in April, regardless because it's on my little 22 books for 2022 list. So yeah, I'm very excited and it's going to be gross. Yeah, uh, that makes me sound disturbing, but that's okay. Oh, here's a good suggestion too. Uh, how about some Sean Hudson or James Herbert for some suggestions for April? Hell yeah. Uh, suggest some of those books when I put up the poll. Just everyone keep looking out on my community tab. But since my agenda is somewhere, there it is. I'm going to tell you guys the day that you can look for the post. That way you can know when to nominate. <clears throat> I will be posting asking for nominations on March 9th. That's a Wednesday. So coming up, just a few days away, literally this upcoming Wednesday, I'll be asking for suggestions. So if you have anything you want to suggest, just keep a lookout. You might see it in your feed, but just in case you don't, it will be up by the 9th of March. That's when the post will be up asking for suggestions. I want everyone's voice to be heard. That's very important to me, guys. So if you guys want your opinions heard, always drop them in the comments. If you want your books, to, you know, suggestions heard, drop them in the post comments that I, you know, put out every month asking for nominations. I want this to feel very inclusive for everybody. And just be warned that a lot of the stuff we read, as you guys know, it's disturbing. House of Illusions wasn't so disturbing, but a lot of the other books we might read will be. So just keep that in mind. I do not list trigger warnings. I do encourage people to look up triggers in case they might be triggered by something. However, I just don't post them because I don't like to get it spoiled for me because sometimes it spoils the plot or the kills or whatever. So uh, also be careful of talking about uh, triggers in my Discord. Somebody mentioned that in my Discord and it kind of gave away stuff like for the troop. Um, and I, I was just like, be very careful with that, please. Like, you could say there are triggers in this book. Make sure you look them up if you're worried. If you want to call attention to triggers, you could do it that way. Just be very careful. I don't like anyone to get anything spoiled. And there's a way to hide spoilers on Discord. So just be aware of that. Two vertical lines before and after is how you hide. And that's the safe way to talk about anything that could be a potential spoiler. But yes, great suggestions, DJ. I like that. All right, thank you so much, guys, for spending the afternoon with me. It really brightened my day because today has been, like, a sluggish day for me. I've been kind of, like, bummed. But now I'm, like, freaking jazzed <laughs> and pumped and excited. So really means a lot. And thank you for rushing to finish the book, specifically, Cameron. That means a lot that you were here. Uh, you add so much to the chat because you've got, like, a lot of great thoughts. Crystal, thank you for joining. Katie, you always have wonderful thoughts, too. Ashley, I love that you read this with us as well. Sorry again, guys, that this one was a little slower. I'm hoping that another pick, uh, you know, our picks for March will be faster and better. And I'm almost positive they will be because I've heard great things about the troop. And I've heard emotional things about the girl next door. So I think our discussions will be a lot more in depth, a lot less jokey. There'll still be jokes, I'm sure. Maybe not with girl next door, but probably with the troop for sure. Um, so there will be a lot more to come that is like more horrific and more like horror centric so stay tuned guys and i really appreciate it again uh you guys are just a joy to me and booktube's the best and everyone in the community not just booktubers like the people who watch booktube too so and also 90s friends anybody who just likes 90s stuff and not so much into books i love you guys too all right guys that's it for me for this time as you guys know what i always say is till next time what can you do keep on killing it that's what i always say all right guys have a great rest of your day and if you're watching after the fact have a great day whenever you're watching this guys thank you so very much and that'll do it for me bye <laughs>